I will now, um, Imran will now move back to the chair and I will invite our last speaker, Professor Chantal Simon, to come. Chantal is Medical Director for Professional Development at the RCGP. Uh, she's a GP in Dorset um, and has had a long and um, valuable, uh, made a valuable contribution to professional development through the college. Thank you, Chantal. No, thank you, Imran. Um, I'm talking today to you about geno genomics and ethics. Um, my interest in that is as a GP, but also because recently I've become involved in a research project looking at the best ways to educate um, healthcare professionals on, on ethics and genetics. I think the first thing that we've found when we're looking at this is that people actually don't really understand the difference between genetics and genomics. And genetics is used in the discussion of single gene diseases. And examples of that are cystic fibrosis or haemophilia, whereas genomics refers to a person's entire genetic code, their genome. And variations in different parts of the genome can increase or decrease the chance of developing a, a disease. Um, and diseases such as diabetes and heart disease all have genetic components. Genet genomic medicine refers to the application of ge genomics to clinical care of patients. So, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through some case studies because I think ethics is best discussed when you actually apply it to situations. Um, all these are based on real cases, but they actually use fictitious patients and in fi fictitious um, conditions for those patients. So the first case study is about Andrew. He's 41 years of age. Um, he's got advanced bowel cancer. And on diagnostic testing, he's been found to have an inherited form of bowel cancer called Lynch syndrome, which Jude mentioned earlier. Andrew's parents both died young, but not as a result of bowel cancer, so we don't know anything about their genetics. He's got two siblings, but doesn't have any regular contact with them, and they've got a 50% chance of developing Lynch syndrome. Andrew's been offered help to contact um, trace his siblings so that they can have predictive testing, but he's declined, saying that he will contact him, them himself when he feels a little bit better, and that's the last thing that you have in a letter from the genetics department. You don't really think anything more about it, and then Andrew died. Two years ago, his brother Peter, now aged 39 years, who happens also to be registered with your practice, comes in with symptoms suggestive bowel cancer. He's referred via the two-week wait pathway and he has a Duke C bowel cancer. But Peter didn't know that he was at increased risk of bowel cancer because he didn't really have any contact with Andrew and he hadn't had any bowel cancer screening. So what questions does that bring up? If you do know that a patient's at risk of a particular disease because a relative has an inherited condition, do you disclose that to your patient or wait for the relative to inform them? There's no simple answer to that. Um, there's the legal position and the GMC position are actually directly opposite to each other. There's only been one case, and that was St George's um, Hospital. Um, they didn't tell a relative that a patient had a genetic condition. The relative then sued St George's. And that was actually dismissed from court on the basis that St George's didn't have any clinical responsibility for the relative. But in this case, Peter is registered with your practice too, so you do have a responsibility. The GMC takes the position that if there's serious risk of harm, then you do have a duty to disclose, but only if you can actually prevent that harm from taking place. I think in this case, you can argue that you can prevent that harm from taking place because Lynch syndrome is a form of bowel cancer and you can screen and therefore reduce mortality and morbidity. But what if it was something like Huntington's disease where there is no action that you can take to prevent the person from getting that disease? Also, if you think that you should be disclosing information, then what level of risk and what level of evidence regarding interventions would be required to disclose that information to um, and, break, and breach confidentiality? And does it raise different issues from those when you're contact tracing, for, for example, in, in sexually transmitted diseases? I think it probably does because in sexually transmitted diseases, um, you can actually prevent an individual from getting a disease. If it's a genetic condition, they have the disease already. What you might be able to do is reduce their mort mortality or morbidity. Move on to a second case study. Rosie's three years of age and she's got significant developmental delay and some unusual facial features. We were talking earlier about rare diseases and when you see 
developmental delay and maybe some other genetic looking um, features, you should actually then investigate a little bit further. So her paediatrician requests a comparative microarray testing. What they found was they found a gene deletion encompassing part of the BRCA2 gene, um, which is for um, breast cancer. This actually has no relevance for Rosie right now, but it may have relevance for Rosie in the future. And if Rosie has inherited this from either of her parents, then they or their relatives may benefit from intervention sooner rather than later. So this, in, this raises another set of questions. When you're actually doing a procedure, you should consent somebody and make sure that they're informed about the likelihood of the outcomes of that procedure. But this is completely unexpected results. You couldn't possibly have informed the parents about every possible result of genetic testing. So the parents haven't been consented to, to um, testing for the BRCA2 gene. So should this unexpected result be revealed to Rosie's parents? Another problem with this sort of result, it doesn't have relevance to Rosie now. Our computer systems are very good at actually um, putting on recalls for a year or two, but this is 20 years in the future. Will our computer systems, can our computer systems cope with a recall 20 years down the line? How can we make sure that Rosie actually does get the appropriate screening at the appropriate times? I'll move on to the third case study. John is 25 years of age. He's been seen because his mother's got Huntington's disease. There is a highly accurate test that could actually look at whether John has inherited Huntington's disease, and there's a 50% chance that he has inherited that condition. But after discussion, John decides that he doesn't want to know because there's actually nothing that you can do about it anyway, and he doesn't want to have that hanging over him for a long period of time. But then three months later, John's girlfriend, Samantha, attends with their four-year-old son, Ben. Samantha wants Ben tested because she's seen how awful Huntington's disease is from her mother-in-law. And she would like to be prepared if Ben's inherited the disease. But then should Ben be tested? If you test Ben and he comes out positive for Huntington's disease, then of course that gives you information about his dad, John, who doesn't want to be tested. Also, shouldn't Ben have the choice of, of knowing whether he's got Huntington's disease because it won't affect him until he's in his adult years. So should that test be delayed? I mean, the current guidance is that it should be delayed. If there's nothing you can do to prevent a condition, you should wait until the individual is of an age to be able to make an informed decision. Does the fact that the disease in question is paternally inherited, so it's come from the father, mean that John has a greater stake in or say about genetic testing of their child? No, it doesn't. Um, both parents have an equal say it, as far as the law is concerned. Would the situation be different if Samantha was pregnant and requesting antenatal testing? And the answer to that is yes. Whilst the, the baby's unborn, it's actually the mother's decision whether to undergo testing or not, even though that would still give information about John. I'm going to move on to a final case study because we've only got a very limited amount of time. Um, but it's something that I think that GPs are now seeing increasingly. Punnett's a 47-year-old businessman. He's happily married, has three children, aged 12, 9 and 7. And he's actually gone online and he's found a commercial genetic testing te uh, kit to look for disease on the basis that he just wants to be prepared. He wants to look after his family. And he gets a whole load of results through and doesn't really understand what they mean. So he makes an appointment with you to discuss the results. And this is what he shows you. So these are the ones where you might expect that he could possibly develop the disease. First one's anti alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's fairly easy. You can do a test for that in primary care. That we, could, we can probably look at that for him. Hereditary thrombophilia. Again, we could probably look at that in primary care. The last two are slightly more difficult. Late onset Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. What can you say to put it at that point? What can you say to alleviate his worries? What can you say about his, his risk of actually getting those diseases? Then he moves on to the carrier status. Now, this is actually a very long list and it's in alphabetical order. I've only included the first six. As you can see, they're very rare diseases and personally, I've not heard of any of them. So it's very, very difficult for a GP to advise in this sort of situation. Just looking at the first um, um, slide of results, it's carrying the late onset Alzheimer's disease gene, the APOE gene. Does that mean that he's actually going to develop that disease? No, it doesn't. It just means that he's at increased risk of, develop, of developing dementia in the future. 
What implications might that test result have for Pernet? For example, what about insurance? What about his mortgage? What about his work? Um, at, at present, there's a moratorium um, agreed with the British um, uh, insurance industry whereby predictive genetic testing does not have to be disclosed if, if the insurance company writes to a GP for results. However, that only, that's only in place till 2019. It's due for a review this year. So what will happen in the future? Might Punnett have to disclose this information? Might it load his premiums? And how might you manage the situation? What do you say to Punnett? So the key points really from this are that genetics and genet genomic information is complex and it applies across the whole family and between families. A result for one person may have relevance for others. Who does that genomic test but result belong to? There is a big tension between genomic medicine, which involves families, and a modern medical framework with huge emphasis on the individual's rights and autonomy. Genomic testing may reveal unexpected information, and this should be discussed before embarking on the test. Otherwise, it's very difficult to discuss it res retrospectively. Genomic testing may also give, may give accurate information about risk, but unfortunately, it can't predict when or even if a condition will occur. So therefore, when you're doing genomic testing, it's very important to say to people that actually the results that you get won't necessarily mean that they're going to go on to develop those diseases. And finally, as with Punnett's case, there's a potential for stigmatisation and discrimination as a result of genetic testing. Now, I think one of the things as a GP that I find most difficult is I don't know where to go for help. And I think it's very, very important um, to realise that the clinical genetics departments are a good source of information. There's also a National Genomics Forum, Genetic, gen, genetics forum. Um, and also local ethics committees can also help with difficult decisions. Thank you. Chantal, thank you very much. A really wide range of issues and um, considerations around the ethics and social mm. implications of, of genetics. Um, so there's a question here about should we be deferring over-the-counter test results if somebody comes in with their printout? Should we be deferring them to clinical genetics? Do they have the capacity to deal with this information? I don't think they do have the capacity to deal with that information. I think there's also an issue of cost. Um, I think um, there's currently a consultation about um, how to manage these situations because I think we're going to see them more and more and more. Um, and um, although there isn't um, published guidance at the moment, I think the guidance will be that if somebody has a test done privately and wants advice about that test, unless there's a gene mutation that we would normally test for, we should be asking for a private um, opinion at that point. And what are the good points about the NHS that help support people um, who are thinking about genetic testing? I think um, the NHS has a very clear structure in place for supporting people who are looking at uh, are thinking about genetic testing. They, the clinical genetics departments have clinical genetics advisors who are specially trained to talk about these issues. Um, there aren't enough at the moment to actually um, support the amount of genetic testing that's likely to happen in the future because this is a, a rapidly growing field. However, um, I think that the NHS is looking at ways to, to develop networks um, to support GPs when patients come in to ask these questions because I think in a 10 minute consultation it's very, very difficult to go through all the issues and ramifications of genetic testing with a patient sat in front of you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the last question that I'll just um, raise is somebody's raised a question about um, if someone's test results shows that they've got an increased risk, say, of diabetes, does this change the advice we give them about lifestyle? No, I don't think it does, because I think the advice about lifestyle actually applies to everyone. Chantal, thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, for giving some really excellent talks. We hope... Um, you've got a flavour of a wide range of, of issues and considerations around genomic medicine. Um, the talks will go up on the um, Ask GP website um, together with a list of um, further reading and also contact details um, if you want to contact us to, um, to follow through on any aspects of what you've heard today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.